Welcome to lecture number seven of Advanced Dynamics, MEC 4428. We're going to be continuing our discussion of analytical dynamics today, and this is a continuation of last week's lecture on virtual work. Today we're going to drive Lagrange's equations, and this is fairly complicated, all right? And it's also drawn out, meaning it takes a while. But what it allows you to do is it prevents you to find the equations in motion just knowing the system energies. They're an extension of virtual work, so the, we use the information we've gained out of doing virtual work and on all of that, and require some complicated work, as I said before, to try to find. Along the way, we'll talk about what's called generalized forces, and the, gen the sense of generalized forces is very similar to generalized coordinates that we talked about last time. What's most important to you, at least for the purposes of the, of the exam, say, is really how these equations are used. It's something we'll look at in the, in the examples that we have at the end of this. But as well, it's a good idea to kind of be familiar with the process because there's always a possibility of a question just, just how the process is, it goes with this. I don't expect you to be able to drive it, but I expect you to be able to, to know what's going on and the reasons why each of the terms in the equations appear uh, in the final result. Okay, so let's get started. From last time we had the virtual work, delta W is equal to the sum from I1 to N of F sub I delta dot delta R sub I. And of course these are both vectors again. And if F I and delta R I are always in the same direction, for example, and we have, just to, we'll define here, R I is equal to X sub I for all I from 1, 2, 3, all the way to, say, a number of particles, we'll say, uh, or number of forces, I should say, is equal to n, then um, we can get rid of the vector part. As shown here, if the sum over j, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way to 3n for 3n Cartesian coordinates, x sub j, then we could also write the virtual work in that manner too. So. Notice that we're writing in two different ways. This one is in terms of, say, I for whatever, whatever that is, and this is for the, for the forces. Okay, and then we're writing in terms of J for particles times 3 to give us something related back to the Cartesian coordinates. Okay, now if you remember back from what we were talking about before, we could write three n equations for our Cartesian coordinates, x1 through x3n, as a function of our generalized coordinates, where x1, for example, is equal to q1, and something of q1, q2, all the way through to qn, and then maybe we have time t in here. If you remember, we, we had maybe like x1 is equal to q1 uh, sine q2, and then x2 is equal to... Uh, Q1 cosine Q2, for this is sort of like um, uh, polar coordinates, maybe this is like a R and theta. And if we took the, use the, the delta vir virtual operator on this, then we'd have, as is shown here, delta X1 is equal to delta F, and so if we had like, our, for example, X1 is equal to Q1 cosine Q2, for example, then we'd say delta x1 then is equal to delta of all of this stuff in here, q1 goes on q2. And of course then you notice that we could take the, like the, sort of like the derivative okay, sort of like a derivative in here on all of this in the parentheses uh, and see what we get. If we do that, if we actually do just this, this is very the general form all right. If we do the very general form, we get delta xj is equal to the partial of f sub j with respect to q1, for example. And this is just for the jth term, okay? Partial of f sub j with respect to q1, delta q1, plus partial of fj with respect to q2, delta q2, so on and so forth. And this is from our, our chain rule, okay? 
and also just the fact, you know, you're expanding across all the derivatives. If you look back here, right, we'd have delta x1 is equal to delta f q, just like this here, but then this is, right, a part of all of this stuff, say q1, q1 cosine q2 delta q1 plus partial of delta q2, q1 cosine q2 delta q2, just like we would normally do, right, sort of maybe in our heads, but it's something that we, not something we particularly perhaps think about. So this, for example, this would be cosine q2 delta q1 plus, then we'd have q1 um, with a minus sign in there, wouldn't we? Sine q2 delta q2. And that would be our, our specific example for this. All right. Now, if you remember, we had in here as well, we had the time function in here, but we don't have to worry about that so much because if we look over here, we see that delta t is equal to zero, isn't it? So as a consequence, then, this goes out to zero, and all we're left with is this final term, the sum from 1 to n of partial of f sub j with respect to q sub i, delta q sub i, for j is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to here to our 3n of the Cartesian coordinate directions multiplied by all of the forces in, right? So, if we take this equation and then put it in our virtual work, okay, it goes in to the vector free form, vector free form, okay, then what we end up with is we end up with the original summation on j. And notice that this is a summation on i. We switch to from i from 1 to n, okay? And because you notice that we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, all the way to n, and then you have time t. This is across each of the generalized coordinates. So i is across i is across the generalized coordinates while j is across the Cartesian coordinates. So we have j over here, and we have i over here. So the summation from 1 to 3n of f sub j multiplied against the summation from 1 to n of partial f sub i with respect to q sub i times delta q sub i, just this up here, and that's equal to something here. If we rearrange things, we've got everything that's written in terms of uh, f sub j, partial f sub i with respect to q sub i times, all that times delta q sub i. This term of the parentheses we'll call the generalized force. So this, this term here is called the generalized force. And it will define it by q sub i. It's not the same as the force um, along the particular Cartesian coordinate directions, but rather it's the, the mapping of that to each of the generalized coordinates. q sub i is equal to summation of f sub j partial f sub i with respect to q sub i, where it's the sum over all those terms, right? Okay. So then, if we wanted to, we could write virtual work in terms of virtual work in terms of generalized forces. So now if we define all right, each of our vectors here, r sub k is equal to x sub k, e sub k, plus x sub k1, plus e sub k1, plus x sub k2, e sub k2, for k, when it's 1, 4, what we're doing is we're saying that this is a vector in three Cartesian unit vector directions. Okay, so this is so the vectors are in three Cartesian unit vector directions here. And we've got to do this all the way out to the very last set of vector directions. And this is for each of our written out this way. And then we could say then that our each of our vectors, r sub k, is written, could be written in terms of the generalized coordinates, q1, q2, all the way through. And then we have t in here as well. 
because of how we've defined each of these. Each of these is written in terms of some sort of f of k of q1 all the way out through to qn and time t, right? So we could write the vectors that are a function of those terms in the same way. And this is where it gets a bit long. If we looked at the time derivative of this, then we could say we take the time derivative of r sub k and we get the velocities. And the reason we might do this is we're going to talk about kinetic energies later, and we might need that. And so that's the time derivative of this. But then if we write it in terms of generalized coordinates, then we'd say we'd have a partial of r sub k with respect to q1, time derivative of q1 with respect to time t, because q1 is only a function of of time t, really. All right. And we just add it all up and, and go from 1 to n. That's the number of generalized coordinates that we have. And then over here, kind of in dim writing, we have partial of r sub k with respect to time t. Sorry about the background. All right, so if we do that and we, we sum everything up rather than writing it out longhand, then we'd have from the summation from, of i from 1 to n, a partial of r sub k with respect to q sub i times q dot sub i, where q dot sub i, for example, is that term. And then we also have to worry about the time derivative, partial of r sub k with respect to time t by itself because of this last functional functionality. Okay, this equation looks somewhat like equation 4, except now we're using derivatives, all right, instead of virtual displacement. And one thing to notice is that this isn't equal to zero up here, this partial of r sub k with respect to time t, but then, of course, our virtual displacements is equal to, were equal to zero. So let's go back and look there real quick and see what we were talking about. This is where we were talking about. Notice that this first term looks a lot like the first term from the equation we just looked at, and except we were missing the time part. Okay, so there's that first term, and then we have the time part in here as well. All right, so then if we take the partial of this, Term, and you'll see why we're doing it a bit later. It's all a bit, a bit unclear at the moment, I'm sure. But if we take the partial of this, the velocity term, v sub k, with respect to q dot l, notice that okay, partial with respect to q dot l, okay, then what we're going to do is, is the only time that this actually equals, doesn't equal zero, is when this l here is equal to the i here. And then this term will completely go out. So if we take, take the partial of this v dot k, or r k dot k, with respect to q dot l. Notice we've got a q dot i in here. The only time that that actually doesn't equal to zero is whenever y you have partial of q dot l and where l is equal to i. So what we end up with is we actually only end up with this particular term where an i is equal to l. All the other summations, terms in the summation drop out. This term drops out too. So we end up with partial r sub k with respect to q sub l. Hmm. All right. Also, the time derivative of this, a partial of r sub k, the original r sub k itself with respect to q dot l, is equal to the summation of the second derivative of r sub k with respect to q sub l and q sub j times is a partial of q sub j with respect to time t. Notice that we're using a chain rule here. And then we have to add in the time derivative here of partial of r sub k with respect to q sub l because this again, there's a time dependence here of r, r sub k directly on time t. And you can get all this by expanding derivative with respect to time t of what we just had on the previous page. Okay. Lastly, then we have the partial of r dot k with respect to q l itself. Notice there's no dot here. Okay, so we're not taking a time derivative with respect to the, the generalized velocity coordinate. We're just taking the position coordinate. So that's equal to the summation of partial of the, with respect to q dot l of all of this stuff, what this is going to be inside of here, partial of r sub k with respect to q dot i, partial of q sub of, of j with respect to time t. Let's actually be a j, pardon me. 
and then plus partial q dot q with respect to q l of partial of r sub k with respect to time t. So then we have a second partial of r sub k, the q l q j down here at the bottom, multiplied against partial of q j with respect to time t, right? Plus partial of respect to time t of partial of r sub k with respect to QL. And we've replaced this with what we had on the previous page. All right, we're able to replace that. And that's the same as this equation, isn't it? It turns out, then, that if we equate the two, then what we can, we can realize is, is that this has to be equal to this. And it isn't obvious unless we work all this out. But the time derivative of this partial of this position vector with respect to Q to QL, no dot here, is equal to the time partial of the velocity, R dot sub K with respect to QL. And that also happens to be equal to the partial of Q sub L of the time derivative R dot K with respect to time T. Okay, so we're going to use a few of these relations in a, uh, in a bit, so please bear with me. If you don't follow all of this, then please do go back through it, because it does it does actually add up to meaning something a bit later on, even though it may not look like it right here at the moment. Newton's second law says that the sum of the forces on a particular particle is equal to the time derivative of the 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 linear momentum of that particle if f sub i is the result of the, of the external forces applied to particle i. So then we could rearrange things in in this manner. F sub i minus p dot sub i is equal to zero for i equals one, two, three, four, all the way through to n, where n represents the number of particles, in lowercase n, right? So suppose the system of n particles goes through a series of virtual displacements delta r sub i, and you can sort of see maybe where we're going with this already. Uh, the virtual work done by that approach is, we can find it as equal to zero again, and the critical difference here is that we have not static situation. All right, it's actually dynamic, and what we've done is we've left this this linear momentum in here, the time derivative of the linear momentum. And what this is called is called the de Lambert's principle, and equation ten here. If we write it out a little more carefully, we can actually write out what this this linear momentum is and you'll see why the, all these equations from the previous page actually end up being important. But if we write it out by, this is what we traditionally said our virtual work is for static systems, and then we subtract off the, the linear momentum, rate change of time with respect to linear, uh, rate, change, rate change with respect to time with linear momentum, dotted with the virtual displacements, and the difference between the two is equal to zero if we add up from one to n over all the particles. All right, so if we actually substitute in for this, this delta r sub i, we can get out of it. Notice that this is our vector again. This is part of the reason we looked at our vector and defined our vector in terms of Cartesian coordinates, and those Cartesian coordinates were defined in terms of generalized coordinates uh, there again. And here we've gone straight from the vector to the Cartesian coordinates, partial of r sub i with respect to q sub j, delta q sub j, and actually, we have to add all these up because this is, this is like an expansion across Q sub j, where our j goes from 1 to n. By using this equation, by using equation 4, we say delta r sub i is equal to the sum from i of 1 to n of partial r sub i with respect to Q sub j, delta Q sub j. We've ended up with this relation. That's just our substitution there. Okay, so as a consequence then, this this gives us um, our original virtual work statement is actually can be written in terms of the generalized forces okay since Q sub J is equal to these these forces on each of the particles mapped across each of the of the coordinate system directions the other term in equation in the equation we have to worry about though is not the static part, but now we have to worry about the inertia term. Right. Sum from 1 to n of 
the rate change with respect to time of the linear momentum, dot producted with delta r sub i. Now this, this with the summation sign on there is actually can be expanded out, and that's equal to the time derivative of the mass times of the velocity of the particle, or r sub i dot, right? And we've substituted in here. Or delta r sub i. This first term, right, is our p sub i dot. But now if we look, we can, we can actually do some thinking about what all this really is supposed to mean. If I take this term, okay, and put it inside of this set of parentheses, then we, what this represents is we might say this is like the time derivative of a as a vector, say, and we're going to dot product that with b. But then this is actually, if we go back and look at what we had as a whole, a dot b, then we could say we have this plus, then we have a dotted with the time derivative of b. So let's take a look at that. This term actually ends up being this term over here on the left. We actually have the the term here written here and then we have this extra term so this part okay is the whole and then minus this other part all right so if we look at the whole the time derivative of m i v sub i dot partial of r sub i with respect to q sub j times delta q sub j Okay, and you have the summation signs over here. That's the summation signs over on the left. Same thing, where we have what we have here, um, time derivative of m sub i, v sub i, that's the rate changes with respect to time of the linear momentum, dot with the partial of r sub i with respect to q sub j. And then we have m sub i, v sub i, the linear momentum, dotted with the time derivative of the partial of r sub i with respect to q sub j. And don't forget our delta q sub j over here for both of these terms. It's over here too, isn't it? Okay. So anyway, the point of it is, is that this is this term here is actually the missing term that we had from original equation here. We already have taken care of our static virtual work. This is due to the inertia forces, and once we have this taken care of, we'll actually we can actually write something out about this term, and we can write stuff out about this term, and uh, rearrange things so that we'll actually replace this whole thing with this term plus this term.